lump sums. Why do we have lump sums? Well, historically, I think there was two principles which drove the, our payment of a lump sum. Uh, courts, if you go back you know, a few hundred years, you can't expect courts to have repeat litigation, to have the same case being brought back to them time and time again. You get your damages once and for all. It's a single payment, that's it, go away, that's the end of the case. Uh, and here's the earliest case I, I, I cited the tort course by many, uh, many years, Fetter and Beale. It's only very barely imported back in 1699. Uh, um, the claimant uh, was injured by the defendant. Uh, his, his, his brain had been injured. Uh, he got some damages uh, in some shape or form from the defendant, but then wanted to come back to have an operation on his head. The thought of this happening in the 1690s is, is horrific. Goodness knows what sort of operation he was going to go for. Um, but the court said, in any event, you can only get your damages once. You've had your damages, you can't come back and have more money for this operation which you want. Horrific though it may be. That was the principle. Fetter and Beale, you can only get your damages once. And indeed, we did that not only for the burden, easing the burden on the court, but for easing the burden upon defendants. Well, why would you want to ease the burden upon defendants? They're liable, yes, they're liable, but should they really be subject to continuing obligations for many, many, many years? Isn't that too much of a burden for them to face? We, say, we saw similar arguments with regard to the burden upon defendants when we dealt with causation, didn't we? Cause in law, we draw a limit to the defendant's liability. Well, maybe here too, we thought that we should draw a limit to the defendant's liability. They should only pay damages once. Um, the courts over time have recognised this, this is an uh, unfortunate rule in some respects. Uh, um, I, I go back to a Canadian case. Back in 1927, uh, Fournier against the Canadian National Railway, uh, where a Canadian trial judge thought that the, the railway, having killed a, a man, that the, the, the payments to the widow and the children ought to be, be a sort of pension taking place over a period of time. And they ordered the railway company to pay a pension to the, to the to widow and children. No, that was overruled. Canadian case, it came to the British appeal courts at that time, as they all did, and the court said, no, only a lump sum can be awarded. So, uh, there we are, that pr two principles supported by the lump sum system. I think there was all historic factors affecting lump sums as well. I mean, back a couple hundred years ago, you couldn't really see a court administering periodical payments. It's not like today when you, we've got computerized systems, we've got automated systems, we've got direct debits, uh, we've got courts supervising um, family law arrangements, for example, uh, uh, financial arrangements. You can go back to court and get change of orders and so on. There, there are ways in which courts are involved on a continuing basis nowadays, which they could never have been back in Victorian times. And they can, the insurers can deal with payments on a regular basis. They don't have to fill out a check every week and send it off to you. There are automated systems which can deal with this. So we're in different times. I think also the welfare state influences our view of, of things. Um, we're nowadays being very used to, uh, through the welfare state, pensions being paid periodically to people. Old age pensions, sickness payments. You know, from the late 19th century onwards, the state takes over and administers. And we got used to to a pension mentality in welfare. Uh, and so you can see students being very critical of the lump sum system at times. Uh, in, in many ways, I think I've put down, so this is an Orwell quote almost, isn't it? You know, two legs good, four legs bad. Some students say, pension's good, lump sum's bad. Well, you, you, you can't take that, that view. I think you've got to be uh, a bit more, for, uh, sophistic, more sophisticated than that. You just can't say pension's good, lump sum's bad. It needs further thought. Uh, um, uh, um, but you have been affected by the mentality of the welfare state around us, which you wouldn't have been had you been studying this subject back in Victorian times. Um, wh why are, are possibly pensions uh, very difficult for our system, and why shouldn't we have pensions? Well, look at the first point I've got here. What's the advantages of lump sums? Point one, uh, lump sums efficiently deal with a mass of small claims. Our system is awash with small claims. The average claim is for less than £5,000. It's the compensation culture. It's the minor injury. It's the whiplash claims. 
that, that figure I've got there on point one, that 92% of cases have no finan future financial loss. There is no continuing financial loss. There is no widow and children around. In 92% of cases, that figure comes from the Pearson Commission of 40 years ago. It hasn't changed. The overwhelming majority of cases, more than 9 out of 10 cases, are small claims, uh, and that's as true today as it was uh, in, in the late 1970s. And the way you efficiently deal with them, of course, is via a lump sum. You can't imagine periodical payments for small uh, £5,000 claims. Secondly, it assists the rehabilitation of the claimant, the lump sum is said. It, it avoids the, 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 pe the stress of those periodical reviews. It avoids you having to go back to the doctor to be re-examined. We know how traumatic these medical examinations can be. We've seen that in Social Security at the moment, don't we? Uh, uh, with the, the change to universal credit and the sorts of considerable unhappiness that's been caused with reassessments of disability in various contexts. And you can avoid that in talk, once and for all lump sum. Um, I, I, and you can also, not, it's not just the doctor's rehearing, if you then have to go back to court or back to your tribunal in Social Security uh, and, and, and re-establish your claim, that is a very traumatic experience. Sort of the sort of I, I Daniel Blake type stuff. Uh, there are great problems people have with dealing with uh, these re-examinations, whether it be by court or by doctor. Uh, so, the lump sum completely disposes of a claim. We don't have the monthly lump reminders landing on our mat about how disabled we are. Um, it, it, the capital sum, in stereotypical terms, it gives you the freedom to change direction in life. Oh, we're very sorry about the fact that your leg was severed down the coal mine by the coal fall, which wasn't properly supervised and shouldn't have happened. We're sorry for that. We'll give you a lump sum. Here you are. Now you're a disabled person. Go away and open a corner shop in the Welsh Valleys. Um, in stereotypical terms. You can change your direction in life. You're no longer going to be a coal miner at the face. You can be the local village shopkeeper. Uh, uh, it's assisting the rehabilitation of the claimant. He can change direction in life. It offers him uh, greater freedom. Uh, it's not paternalistic. We're not going to tell you what you can do with this 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 pound award. Uh, you can just do as you wish with it. Of course, if you spend it all, then the state, unfortunately, has to come back and pay you more. Um, you can always throw yourselves back on the state if you uh, use up all the money. Um, so on the one hand, it's not paternalistic, but... Uh, it does create an obligation for, for the state if that money is misused. Um, a fourth point, well, this is one that used to irritate me quite a lot when I was closely involved with structural settlement. We would go to a law firm with a seriously injured claimant and meet the claimant's lawyer and him or her, and they would say, well, that's very interesting what you've just told us, uh, this new development but that's really not what my client wants. That's not what claimants want. And I used to get very frustrated uh, because what my client wants was often something which had been preformed. The, the client from the very beginning knew that he w was entitled to a substantial sum of money and he was thinking in lump sum terms. The media, uh, 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 coverage of the law of tort makes it look as though it deals with lump sums. It's this magic seven-figure million pound plus claims. The lawyer is talking, if anything, in lump sums to the client. Lump sums, there's, the periodical payments and pension payments are never examined and certainly weren't back in the 1990s and before. So I was, always thought the claimant was too much influenced by his or her lawyer uh, uh, and media perceptions of the tort system. And also, I thought the claimant wasn't being properly advised in many respects. The claimants were not being told of the advantages of lump sums in, in the way that they should have. Um, you know, when people retire from work, they don't, I know they could choose part of their uh, retirement as, as a lump sum, but they see the sense of having a pension. They see the sense of annuities. People, when they're in the pension mentality of retirement from work, happily will think of pensions and see they want something to last for the rest of their lives, to be guaranteed for the rest of their lives. 
Now, no, that sort of mentality wasn't apparent with the claimants I used to see in the 1990s of uh, serious injury cases. They'd been, they'd been uh, um, introduced to the lump sum method. That's what they were thinking of. Um, I, I often thought that uh, claimant lawyers didn't really understand their clients very often and didn't understand with serious injury victims, if you give them a large lump sum of money, uh, that creates many problems for them. Many claimants are actually fearful of their financial future. Would you like now to be given a, your, your future earning your capacity? Boil down now, we'll give you a lump sum now, what would that be? If you're going to earn substantial amounts of money, we'll be talking about several million pounds. Will you take several million pounds from me now and never come back to ask for anything more ever again? I'm sure there's some of you who'd love to have several million pounds now and would never come back to me again. But that, the, the responsibility and the, and the fright that's caused to claimants who are told, that's it, there's no more, you've got to make that last for the rest of your uncertain life. And by the way, if you live out, out to live your life expectancy, tough. You've just got more years, that's nice for you, but you've got no funding. Uh, I think there's many, many disabled people I've met who, who, who were actually very, very worried about their future. So rather than you know, it being obvious that they want the lump sum, that's not obvious at all, in my view. Um, should they always get one, or even if they actually want it, should they always get it? Uh, um, well, of course, if, if, just because they want the lump sum, if they spend the lump sum, the state then has a responsibility, as I just said. People shouldn't always get what they want. Um, uh, you can't, for example, go away and sell your tort claim. You've got a tort claim. You can't go into the marketplace and say, you can buy this tort claim. You can sue on my behalf if you like. And here you are. Just give me a lump sum in exchange. I'll go away. No, you're not allowed to do that. The courts will not allow you to uh, um, sue by uh, subrogation, as it were, to sue by assignment. No, the claimant is not allowed to sell his tort claim. It would be considered to be an abuse of the system. And it's what he shouldn't be... We're going to take care of it. We're going to make sure he's not, he's not uh, um, poached by, by, by you coming to him and offering to a lump sum for his claim and buying them up. No, no, you can't do that. Um, so the claimants don't always get what they want. And they shouldn't always get what they want because the state ultimately has a responsibility. From the insurer's point of view, uh, um, insurers, similarly, um, a number of them in the 1990s had a sort of black and white view of this. Oh, no, we don't do periodical payments. Um, we don't do it for a, a number of reasons. So, some of them just had a blanket, you know, no, that's new stuff, we don't do that. Even though I knew their head office did do it. Even though I knew they were doing it in certain parts of the country, you could go up to Newcastle or whatever, and the, the local office of, uh, of one of the insurers, they would say, oh, that's new stuff. We don't do that sort of stuff. No, they had a certain amount of autonomy. It was very, very frustrating to have the view, no, we don't do that sort of stuff. Uh, it, was, it could be good for them and good for the, good for the claimant as well. Um, mind you, there were, there were difficulties. I can sympathize with certain insurers who turned their back on, on periodical payments. They certainly didn't want to get involved in what they see as long-tail exposure. Now, in insurance terms, it's a very familiar term, they don't want to be exposed to liability a long way down the line. They don't want to be exposed to uh, liability. They're writing the policy now, covering the defendant now, and there could be claims on that policy for the next 30, 40 years. Claims might arise distantly down the line. They don't like that. They want to know. They can't cope with long-term liability. Making reserves, making payments 30 years hence is problematic. So they don't like uncertain long tail liability. They would have to maintain extensive reserves to pay for these future costs. They don't like the continued cost of administration. Um, lump sums get rid of the whole problem all at once. There's no continuing administration. You don't have to update payments and make payments I don't think that's a great problem nowadays, although but insurers still complain to me. Um, we've got to work out every so often, every year or two, whether the claimant is still alive or not. Well, I thought that was quite a different, easy thing to do, but no, they, they're complaining with that administrative commission cost. They certainly complain about maintaining the file open. It's got to be kept open for ad infinitum. They don't like that. Um, well, what are the disadvantages? Let's now look at the disadvantages of lump sums, and these students are very 
familiar with. Well, lump sums don't return you, do they, to the pre-accident position. You lose your income for the rest of your life, and your income is capitalized into a lump sum. And the money that arises, as soon as you invest that lump sum, you're expected to invest that lump sum, mind. Remember that? You're expected to make a real rate of return. But the money that arises is investment income. It's not earned income. And that's taxed differently in systems. Every tax system taxes investment income differently from earned income. It's not, it's not replacing like with like, is it? The capital sum is different because the capital sum increases your freedom and your responsibility and your fears for the future are increased by, by, by that. It's also more easily dissipated. Um, you, might, you can lose it more easily. Well, why, why might you lose it? Well, insurers will say, insurers will focus upon um, claimant profligacy and fecklessness. <laughs> It's the, you know, I would say, you know, can, you name, can you name claimants who in the 1960s got damages for, from you as an insurance company who still have those damages? Can you name those? And they, would, they, they didn't have records, uh, and they struggled to, to, to answer that. And so I did uh, empirical surveys uh, for, for the Ministry of Justice and the government on, on this and various aspects. Um, uh, insurers would say, well, they've got, rid of, they've got rid of the money because they've been profligate. They haven't saved it as they should have saved it. They've had, f they've had f friends. When you get lots of money, you get friends. And your friends and family uh, will spend the money for you. Um, they, they've had bad investment advice. Uh, all of which, to some extent, is true. And there are cases where people have blown all their money very, very quickly. You know, pools winners blow it very, very quickly sometimes. That happens with tort winners too. But the real cause is why people in the 1960s didn't have any money in the 1990s was because, as we saw in the last lecture, the discount rate back at that time was 4.5%. In other words, you had to earn 4.5% above inflation Above taxation, you show me somewhere where you can get regular income for 8 or 9% per year. In the real reason why claimants lost their money was because of inflation and the unrealistic expectations of the tort system with regard to the real rate of return they had to make. That's what wiped out their money. At any rate, lump sums are easier to get rid of than periodical pensions. Uh, as one, one person said to me, well, I may be broke under a periodical payment system, but I'm only broke for a month. Um, there's more money coming in next month. Uh, lump sums also are said to be bad because they add to the costs of the system. They, are, they delay payments. They, they cause problems with rehabilitation. Um, why? Why, does they, why do they delay payments? What do lawyers say when the claimant says, well, what's going on? It's been four years now. Have you not dealt with this case? Oh, can you, you must be incredibly inefficient. Oh, no, 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 no. We have to wait. We have to make sure that the effect upon you as, is as we say it is. We don't want to settle this case prematurely. Um, we need an accurate medical prognosis. We've got to rely upon the doctors coming forth with those accurate prognoses. They want time to see what the, the condition is. We want the conditions to stabilize. Uh, um, we, we have to be certain as to what we're doing here. It delays payment. And during this time, it also increases the financial and psychological pressures on the claimant. You know, you, you, you've got immediate financial needs. These are being exacerbated. Your, 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 your work monies have stopped. Your sickness payment from work has stopped. The pressures upon you are greater. We'll be talking about these at the end of the semester in settlement system. Um, there's even something called compensation neurosis, which was a recognized medical condition. It's much more contested nowadays. What is this? Um, well, um, insurers and defendant lawyers would say, compensation neurosis, you've been malingering, don't you? 
There are liars out there. There are cheats who will exaggerate their condition. That's what this is. There are people who don't go back to work because they're conning the system. There are people who don't uh, recover as they should do. They present their worst face you know, they, because they know that there's more money in it. Well, there's a few reactions I have to this, one of which is the usual disabled answer of, well, I have good days and bad days. You can go and see me in my, during my bad days. But, but there is actually medical evidence and psychological evidence that because you know that you're going to be looked at by doctors and lawyers, and there's going to be decisions made on your financial future. And this is going to be a mega, mega decision, far bigger than the importance of buying your house or your car. It's going to be the most important financial decision, which you're not taking yourself, but will affect the rest of your life. Because you know that, psychologically, you know that if you go back to work, you psychologically, if you do get uh, rehabilitation in the way that the, the insurer hopes, um, that's going to result in less money for you. And you're not a malingering cheat. But you are, deep down, affected by this attitude. And you're less likely. It's been medically and psychologically proven. The tort system makes you sick. Tort makes you sick, disgust. You are made worse by the existence of the compensation system, which slows your rehabilitation and stops you getting better. Tort makes you ill, especially tort examination. Right. Um, other, other reasons for criticizing the lump sum. Fourthly, well, what did we see last time when we looked at this? The, the, what we, in the last lecture, I'm just repeating the last lecture here, there are various predictions which the system makes, and they're bound to be wrong, aren't they? Um, two sets of predictions, as in the last lecture. What would have happened to the claimant had there been no accident? We'll never know. The predictions can't be proved false like that. But don't forget, in a, even in a periodical payment system, we still will never know. No matter what our system, we will never know what would have happened to the claimant had he not been injured. So that first set of predictions are the same for periodical payments as they are for lump sums. They're guesswork, and we'll never know what the claimant would have done. But also, we have these other things, which I went through in the lecture last week, last Tuesday. All those, what's now going to happen to the claimant? What work will he do? What job? All sorts of things I, I said to you could cause great dispute between the sides. Well, how long is he going to live? When will death occur? And, you know, um, you know as one judge said, there's only one certainty, the certainty is that we're bound to be wrong. Because, you know, events will show that our guesses well, some of them will be right, some of them will be wrong. But inevitably, that we'll be overall wrong. Uh, if you just think of how we deal with a, a, a case of a, a head injury, we're raising a possibility of epilepsy. Um, the court, in a lump sum system, would give you an allowance for the risk of developing epilepsy. We would not compensate you for, f for developing epilepsy because you don't have it. You suffered a head injury, you've got a 10 or 20% chance of epilepsy, perhaps. It may not manifest itself for five years hence, if at all. We're now going to deal with your case. Here's the compensation for the head injury. Here's the compensation for the risk of epilepsy. It's not the same compensation as if you had the epilepsy, because that would be overcompensating. But we'll give you compensation for the chance. And then what actually happens, five years later, either you've got epilepsy or you haven't got epilepsy. In which case, we've undercompensated you or overcompensated you. Events will prove the lump sum to be false. And it's not just these, uh, these projections, the, these guesses as to what will happen to you in the future. There are certain presumptions, aren't there? And here's the presumption I dwelt on last time. There are certain presumptions. This is the presumption that you will earn a real rate of return, above inflation, above taxation. And we now know... Uh, uh, those rates of return as being the, the relevant current ones. It used to be, before 2001, 4.5%. Very high rate of return. That's why claimants back in the 1960s were unable to match that rate of return. They couldn't get uh, a, a gross return of 8% plus. It was, was very difficult to achieve at any time. Presumptions like, well, the claimant will exhaust the fund on the day he dies. If, if, he, if he doesn't die on the exact day in 40 years' time, we predict he dies, 
If he lives a day longer, we've paid him too little. If he lives a day less, we've paid him too much. It's a presumption. We, we presume also that the standard of living won't rise. In fact, we all know that over the time, we've re since the Second World War, we've enjoyed a rise in the standard of living at 2%. But we, they, they won't benefit from that. No, the presumption is standards of living won't be the same, won't be any different. Tax rates will not change. Well, of course, the tax rates will change. And that's Scarman's quote from a, a case called Lim and Lim Poo Chu. Um, there's only one certainty. The future will prove the award either too high or too low. Well, what can you do about changing the system then? What, can you take into account variations? That's, first of all, variations because of, of inflation, the stuff which wiped out the, the damages in years past. Can you change for price inflation? Can you change for wage inflation? Because wage inflation is normally higher than price inflation. At the moment, price inflation is running at mm, about 1.8% of 2019. Uh, wage wages have gone up by 3.4. So we have, a, at one time, after the, the recession, of course, wages were actually not doing very well. Wages actually fell below price inflation. And we were all suffering real decline in our standard of living. But they've come back. Uh, and for 2019, Wage inflation it normally would be a couple of percent over uh, uh, price inflation. Uh, changes in tax and social security rates. Well, now insurers say straight away, hey, if you want to guarantee us, uh, uh, if, you, if you want us to guarantee a payment of inflation-linked damages in the future, if you want to go down price inflation, if you want to go down wage inflation, oh God. Well, we can't, 20, 30 years down the line, we, we can't give those guarantees. That's not a matter for us. The government have got to issue bonds, long-dated bonds, which we can invest in to guarantee this. If you're going to say to us there's an unending liability 30, 40 years down the line, we can't do it. You can nationalise tort. So when students want to guarantee damages awards for inflation, remember that the danger is nationalisation of the law taught. Okay. What about changes in other than the finance? What about changes in medical conditions? Well, that's not easy to deal with either. Lots of students think it'll be easy to deal with medical condition changes. It's not in a periodical payment system. Um, okay, so your client gets worse. And three years down the line, he's substantially worse off. Can you come back to court? If you came back to court, to get more money, well, what's the difficulties? Well, deteriorated, well, from what? Well, from when we gave him the money. Well, what medical assessment were you used to give him the money? Did you agree a medical assessment with both sides? Of course, if the case goes to court, yes, that's fine. But the vast majority of cases don't go to court. There's no agreement. You know, you're saying that the effect of the injury was X, and I'm saying the effect of the injury is Y. All we agree on is the bottom line. I will you will pay me a million pounds. There's no, there's no agreed medical documentation, often. That's, so, in the absence of an agreed medical report, variation of the law. How do you deal with contributing negligence? Similarly, in the, in, in the, it's a matter of the bottom line. You're offering me a million pounds. You're saying there's contributing negligence. I'm saying there's not, but I'll take the million pounds. There's no agreement on the level of control neg. How are you going to deal with that? if you're going to give more money three years later. Defenders are saying 25% could be negligence. You're saying there never was. So in the absence of decisions on medical assessment and on con neg, deterioration from what? Who's going to do this in adjudication three or five years down the line, 10 years down the line? Courts? Well, the, the courts are, are actually chock a block at the moment. Uh, we're desperate to shove uh, negligence cases down to the lower courts. A high court is, it, it used to be 70% sort of, of the work of the Queen's Bench Division. This was a substantial part of litigation. Um, if you're not going to have court, I don't think courts could cope. You double the number of cases, it just can't happen. You'd inevitably have to push this down to, what, some sort of tribunal system, is it? It's, it's, it's going to be a lesser form of adjudication. Maybe that's the appropriate place. Why, why are all these tort cases taking place out in the superior courts? Our social security cases are all, of course, put elsewhere. We never even expose students to social security cases. 
how long teach it? Um, and how should you make these assessments? Uh, how often? How often should you do it? You know, should, can, you, can you come back every two years, every one year, every three years, every four years? You can have repeated litigation, aren't you, on this one, one sort of thing. What sort of litigation should it be? Um, do, you, do, you want, do you want an adversarial system? Do you want bar barristers on both sides with QCs? Expensive, very expensive QCs on both sides. Again, fighting another gladiatorial battle five years down the line over the whether that arthritis is really being caused by the accident which you seriously suffered or whether the brain injury is affected by uh, your accident or, or your, your, your subsequent drinking and falling in the street or whatever. Um, will you have an adversarial contest or will you have like a, sort of a French inquisitorial, inquisitorial system? with court-appointed experts all over the place, uh, and not have the, the, the panels of QCs arguing on either side. It would be more judge-directed. I don't know. Causation? Well, I've already mentioned some causation issues. Can you really establish 20 years later that the arthritis you've got is caused by the accident? You can imagine all sorts of difficulties that the medics are going to be faced with about types of injuries, what causes what. They, they, they get worse over time, not better. And if the claimant, if his condition improves, are you going to give him less money? Are you going to give him a disincentive to get better? Or are you going to do nothing and thereby overcompensate the claimant? These are difficult questions. 